If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, yet make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied to, don't give way to lies, or being hated, don't give in to hating, and yet don't look too good or talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat these two imposters both the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken, and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it all on one turn of pitch and toss and lose and start again at your beginnings and never breathe a word about the loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings nor lose the common touch, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count with you, but none too much, if you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, then yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son, woman, my daughter. Just, uh, you know, when Rudyard Kipling wrote that a long time ago, there wasn't, you know, equal rights the way they are today. That poem speaks about all the challenges we face in life. A salesman's driving down the road and he sees a pig with a wooden leg. And he calls up to the farmer and he says, Hey, sir, why does your pig got a wooden leg? He said, Well, come on in, son, let me tell you about it. They go in and the farmer starts talking about the weather. He starts cooking some eggs. And the salesman, he's in a hurry, you know. He's like, Hey, sir, why does your pig got a wooden leg? He said, Just relax, son, I'll get to it. Puts a bacon and eggs down in front of him and a cup of coffee. And he says, Sir, could you please tell me why your pig's got a wooden leg? He said, All right. About five years ago, we were coming out of a drought. The whole valley was in trouble. And at that time, three of the farms in the valley had already been foreclosed upon. And on that day, the bank was coming out to take my farm away. I had already gone out and said goodbye to the cows. It's okay to give a name to cows because they stick around a while. Steers, no. Cows, yes. Dogs, yes. Pigs, no. There's a formula there somewhere. <laughs> and I went out and said goodbye to that old hog, and she's digging a hole like she always did, and I smacked her on the rump, and she rawr, at me. And look, I said, what's that she uncovered? She uncovered a buried mastodon, a big old elephant skeleton. They gave us five million dollars for that skeleton. You know what? This entire valley flourishes today because of that pig. Wow, that's great. How'd he get to one leg? He says, well, about a year later, these burglars heard about our good fortune and they came out and tried to take it. That pig bark out of his pen like a Doberman pitcher. Chased them robbers right off the farm. I said, did they shoot him? What do you mean? How'd he get to one leg? Oh, it was much later when when the house started on fire. And that pig broke out like a Dalmatian came in and saved our lives and saved our farm and saved our fortune. So was he hurt in the fire? So what do you mean? The wooden leg, man. How'd he get the wooden leg? He said, think about it, son. After a pig's done all that for you, would you eat him all at once? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be back in a few minutes talking about goal achievement versus goal setting. Putting stress on the people around us. See, there's two sides of stress management. Managing the stress that comes on us and managing the stress that we put on others. Here comes. I've been married to a redhead on April 11th for 40 years. She is navigationally challenged. Any other women in here navigationally challenged? Any other guys? Let's just be honest. Well, I'm just going to work on her. I, I know she's navigationally challenged, which I, I have a problem with GPSs. The voices are always women. That makes no sense to me. But she had a simple task of going to Madison, Wisconsin and picking up her mother. 
and bringing her back. Her, her sister was bringing mom down from Black River Falls. I had a soccer camp that day, and she asked me to write down the, the directions to Madison, Wisconsin. Really? Get on 9094, go that way. Go to exit 132, get off. I have three assistant coaches, I have 57 kids, I gotta get ready for this camp. I didn't write it down. I didn't feel her need. But I thought I'd better call her before I leave just to make sure she made it up there. Timing is about right. I called and I said, are you there? She said, no. Why not? I don't know. She keeps telling me to do a legal U-turn. Who keeps telling you to do a legal U-turn? The lady in OnStar keeps telling me to do a legal U-turn. You know that's not a lady, it's a computer voice, right? Doesn't matter. Are you on 9094? Yes. You're sure? Yes. How do you know? I'm on a four-lane highway. What way or direction are you going? How do I know? Look at your speedometer that's got the compass on there. It'll have letters. Oh, right there by the, the speed, speedometer? Yeah. She goes, I can't see it. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> so I, like, Okay, tell me this. Have you seen a 9094 sign? What, she said, I went through some construction and I was, I was going around. Can you see the sun? Now, this is mid morning, early, it's like 9 o'clock. Can you see the sun? Yes, it's behind me. Uh oh. <laughs> You're going west because what is it, 50, 51 cuts through Madison this way, 94 goes this way. Well, she had gotten off on 51 somehow. I need you to pull off and find a street sign. I got the, the map up on the computer now. Find a street sign and tell me what two streets you are by. She pulls off, she gets by a street sign. I said, what two streets? She says, I can't see them. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> so we're going through this and it's just getting, I'm getting aggravated because now I'm late leaving for camp, right? I said, you need to go back the other direction. Look for signs that say 9094 and just get on 9094. I'll, I'll call you in a couple minutes. Hung up. Got in the car, I start driving, I call her, I said, hello, are you there? She goes, yes, I can see 9094. Awesome. She goes, it's right under me. Great, you're on an overpass. Yes, well, get on it. She goes, I can't, there's no entrance ramps here. Well, then you have to go to where there is. She goes, I'm not leaving, I can see it right here. <laughs> Now, you can imagine how I'm feeling in Illinois. Uh, she's, <laughs> her mom, who's a worry ward, she's like 45 minutes late picking her up. Everybody's stress is just mounting. I said, there's a frontage road somewhere. You need to go up and turn left and start following this frontage road, and it will get you on there. And then just go to exit 132 and look for the Wendy's or whatever it was, Hardee's. She's like, OK. And I said, I don't care if she tells you to make a legal U-turn 30 times. Just do it. It will get you there. Okay, so she leaves. The kids at camp, did not, and it wasn't a Richmond camp, it was Oregon. The kids at camp did not have a good day that day. I took that with me to soccer camp. Pretty sure her and her mom did not have a good ride home in the beginning of it, right? Because her and her mom can kind of lock horns a little bit anyway, and as soon as the mom answers a question, she's stressed up, she's redhead. You know in America you can only have one wife? Unless you marry a redhead. I can only say that when she's not here, work with me. <laughs> the moment I got back in the car at the end of camp, I knew my world had ended. <laughs> I'm like, I've got to make that call and apologize. I, I, I gotta do it. I picked up my phone and there's a text on my phone that said, honey, I'm sorry, I lost my coping me mechanisms. And I went, no, she cannot apologize before me. <laughs> This is not right at so many levels. I took a breath. Okay, that's a, that's a gold nugget right there. Right? We're supposed to take gold nuggets and hold on to them. And I thought, okay. I'm looking at the time. She should have dropped her mom off, but she shouldn't have been to our house yet, so I'm going to give her a call. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. And she had fine in her voice. I mean, you could know, right? Fine, I'm fine. Right? She had fine in her voice, and the word said fine. And I was like, whoa, she's really fine. Who is this woman? What have you done with my wife? And I'm like, 
uh, are you okay? She goes, I, I'm really okay. She goes, and, and she said it again. She goes, I apologize for being so aggravated about this. I should have known the way up there. And then she said, however, if you would have written it down, it would have been a lot better. <laughs> now I had two choices at this point. I could have said, you made it. You didn't need to write it down. Go forth and conquer, woman. Or, you're right, honey. I'll write it down every time from this moment on. And anytime she goes anywhere now, I take that extra two or three minutes and I write down the instructions, no matter if it's someplace she's been a hundred times. I had the opportunity to manage her stress. And I didn't take it. I'm standing here today because Martin Rotter intercepted a football in 1972. Now, how can I say that with any degree of accuracy? Well, it's simple. On that night he intercepted the football, I was his defensive end. And as I turned to throw a block for him, somebody went through my knee and they said I'd never play football again. I was devastated. I'm from Nebraska, where we have farming and football. And football was my ticket off the farm. And it was gone. By December of 1972, my friend Todd Chesmore had asked for a ride to North Platte, Nebraska, so he could join the United States Army. My thought was, you fool. They're shooting people in Vietnam. Why are you going to do this? He said, because I love my country. He was going into the Army for the right reason. I took him down to the Army. I sat in the waiting area. I don't know if you've ever noticed, in Army waiting areas, they only have Army material to read. And I picked up a pamphlet, and this pamphlet said, Fitzsimmons Army Medical Center is the orthopedic center of the United States Army. And I got an idea. If I could get stationed there, I could get my knee fixed. I could go play football. I said, sir, can you put me here? He said, son, you signed this contract. I'll put you anywhere. <laughs> I signed the contract. I became a military policeman. On my first day of duty, I went up to the fifth floor to check out that orthopedic clinic. And as the elevator doors opened up, I'll never forget this cute little angel that was sitting in the reception window. And I thought, if I get to know her, I'm going to figure out who's going to fix my knee. I'm going to go play football. I just leveled up to cheerleaders. You think you can do it? I got to know her. I got to know them. They never touched my knee, and you'll see her in about a half hour when she gets here from work. We've been married for a little over 39 years. Woo! Yeah. I met her on May the 6th, 1974. I asked her to marry me on June 24th, six weeks later. And we are coming up on our 40th anniversary in just a few months. So it's work, but it's there.